least uh, maybe we can all indulge ourselves in the ankle of the athlete, especially focused on handball. And uh, since it's an uh, ankle workshop, we would like to try to make it a bit more practical than usually uh, mentioned in normal lectures. So I have had the privilege of uh, being asked to talk uh, a little introduction on the um, presenters. And by means of an introduction, uh, I would like to show you a little bit the region for the people that are not from here. This is Doha, uh, 50 years ago. This is the Corniche area. And if you look on Facebook, you can see a picture that shows Doha in 1980, and approximately now. The hotel that you see here, the Sheraton, is this hotel. So, not to mention how much development has been realized here, I think uh, this image speaks more than words. Uh, this is the uh, West Bay area um, like one year ago. You see it's all an expansion with new uh, towers rising and it's a thrilling environment not only in the day but in the night. If you take a Dow boat uh, you can see uh, the nice uh, area. I think this slide is uh, appealing to me because of the fact that you see the new developments coming up with respect for the traditional uh, heritage and history that uh, Doha shares also. And when talking about new and old things, I would like to show you a picture that we found of the Munich Olympic Games 1972. This is the Yugoslavian handball team in where you see on the top our uh, acting CMO of Aspetar Hospital, Dr. Popovic, also chief medical officer of uh, the medical um, group behind the handball medical coverage. If you look at them, and if we're talking about ankles, to be honest, nothing has changed if you ask me. Look at this fierce uh, athlete, full of muscles and uh, movement, and look at his core stability, how well he's positioned with his ankle in his throwing um, movement. Also, the landing is a big issue. And here you see our uh, proud leader in full action. On the other hand, there are uh, moments where you get out of balance and that was in 1972 like this and it's still like this. So we're talking about handball uh, ankles and what they have to sustain. Just a little note, uh, this is 1972, the final of the Olympic Games where they won the uh, gold medal. This is our chief medical officer as the pivot of the team. Look how uh, fast the game was at that stage already. If you, did, if you look at uh, football images, footage, from 30 years ago and now, the rhythm has changed a lot. In my humble opinion, that's not the case in handball. And that brings us to Aspetar. You have visited the premises already. And if you look at the zone, uh, Aspetar is localized here. You have the Khalifa Stadium and you have the Aspire Dome, as mentioned on these slides, with now the torch that rose up in the center of the area. So here we are. What is Aspetar's main goals? It's to assist athletes in achieving their full potential. It's a prevention of sports injuries. We'll go a bit further. It's integrating te the technology that is now out there in sports medicine, translating that to research and new uh, developments all the way to the medical practice. The cardiology has had a big amount of interest recently with good outcome in research and providing the medical services in a national sports medicine program. What is Aspetar doing? We're, uh, we're part of the medical coverage with the Red Crescent and our colleagues from Hamad Medical Corporation. In the three venues, we tailor eight hotels, 300 medical staff is day and night available, uh, 14 Aspetar physicians, 17 from the National Sports Medicine Program, and the nurses from the same program. For athletes, spectators, VIP, and media. This brings us to the conference, and uh, I'm happy to introduce, or to have the possibility to introduce our five uh, well, at least four more uh, speakers. This is our team for today. We have Mr. Chris Bleakley, who's going to talk about acute ankle sprains, then uh, the podiatry department um, referenced by Mr. Atal Thompson on the shoe surface interface in handball, then Dr. Geert Sema, uh, the Aspita Chief uh, of Sports Medicine on syndesmotic problematic injuries, uh, Mohsen Abbasi on the chronic ankle injuries, and I have the honor of telling you some words or some updates on the uh, surgical indications. Now, there's not too much data out there. We would like you to be involved in questions. The handouts of how we uh, document our uh, athletes' uh, ankles is on the back side. You can take it away when you leave. And please, uh, happy to assist in practical interaction. I'm happy to give the floor now to Mr. Blake.
thank you very much, and um, it's great to be back uh, in Doha. It's great to be back in this fantastic facility. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the acute um, management of uh, ankle injuries, with a particular focus on ankle sprains and, and uh, involving the lateral complex. Um, I am from Ireland, and although Olympic handball exists in Ireland, if you say handball uh, to someone in Ireland, they automatically think of this, which was the infamous handball uh, from Thierry Henry that stopped Ireland qualifying from the 2010 uh, World Cup. And even though that was five years ago, people still talk about it, because they're very superstitious in Ireland. And actually, the, uh, the Celtic Tiger, which was the economic boom, that Ireland enjoyed in the, the late 90s is thought to have come about due to the feel-good factor that came from qualifying from the 1990 and the 1994 World Cup. So again, that's erroneous causation and I will try and, and make this a little bit more scientific. Um, they're a wee bit off, but hopefully we get the, the picture there. Um, it's quite hard to be scientific um, when you're talking about acute soft tissue injury management because uh, the empirical evidence is lacking uh, and I'm actually doing opposites with my uh, daughter at the minute, teaching her opposites and I could very quickly add in um, the opposites and the polarised opinion uh, that are uh, so prevalent whenever we start to talk about acute soft tissue injuries. So some people will advocate icing, some people heating, some people pro-inflammatory interventions, some people anti-inflammatory interventions, compression, anti-compression, protection and rest. Uh, and uh, then movement. So where does this actually lie? Let's put some context onto it. Um, if we uh, talk about ICE first of all, ICE is a, is a tried and tested and time honoured intervention that people use, but recently there has been some serious criticism and serious doubt that people have been casting. Should you still apply ICE? Uh, is it dangerous? Um, and uh, this quote that's just off screen there, but it says that in some ways, icing is even worse than bloodletting. Now, bloodletting is uh, the Victorian practice uh, that uh, doctors used to use. Um, so is it, is ice as bad as, as people say? Um, look at some recent um, broadsheet headlines in UK papers. Ice does more harm than good. Putting ice on injury could slow healing. Now, this is based on the supposition that ice stops inflammation. And in stopping inflammation, it prevents proliferation and remodeling. But actually, there's no evidence to show that ice stops inflammation. There is evidence to show that ice influences some cells that are involved in inflammation, such as the neutrophil, for example. But that data is based primarily on animal models that use four hours of continuous icing and are talking about te tissue temperature reductions of about five degrees. So they're impossible to replicate in, uh, safely in human subjects. So this has been blown a little bit out of, of proportion. Um, so ice, it, ice is still good, and um, ice is a really cheap and effective way uh, to relieve pain. Another important question we're talking about is, is what modality should we use? And there's, there's a lot out there. Um, and if we compare a couple of um, different modalities here, so if we look at the traditional application of ice cubes versus uh, the new found and new aged whole body chambers that are primarily used for recovery but a lot of people are using them for uh, peripheral lower limb injuries. Which one's better? So if we compare them for three variables, look at cost first of all. Um, an ice bag will cost probably about 50 pence, so half a, a, a British pound. Uh, I go in a whole body cryotherapy chamber is 80 pounds. Um, Whole body cryotherapy is good in the sense that it creates a, a large thermal gradient, but actually those two variables are superfluous whenever you actually look at the bottom one. That is by far the most important because um, when you're talking about a solid in comparison to um, a gas, a solid has much better thermal conductivity. So the practical take home message is um, that traditional methods of icing, tried and tested good old ice cubes, are the most efficient way to draw heat energy from the body. Okay. What about compression? Compression is used a lot in um, acute ankle sprains. And again, like icing, there's probably too much choice out there. Um, but when do we actually think about the magnitude of compression that we use? Um, should we use all these different devices interchangeably? Um, what magnitude of compressive pressure are we actually looking for? And these are quite important questions. 
So if we break these down, they, they shouldn't be used interchangeably because they've got various different compressive pressures. Some are very low, uh, around 5 or 10 millimetres of mercury. Some are extremely high. So in an acute event, if you want to put compression on, what is the optimal dose? There's very little research on this. And I think what you've got to do in that sense uh, is to look potentially at the basic scientific rationale for these. Um, and after an acute injury, we'll obviously get bleeding, but that stops very quickly with vasoconstriction and clotting. The other key um, uh, important activity that happens is white blood cell activation. And remember, white blood cells, like neutrophils, are on the scene very quickly. They're very big, and what they can do um, whenever they're sticking to the sides of the vessel wall before they start to um, transmigrate across into the injury site, they can start to block blood flow. Um, and the same thing will happen because injuries cause a disruption to the osmotic balance. So fluid starts to get drawn out of the vessel and into the interstitial space, and that causes vessel collapse. So is there any rationale, when we consider that's what's happening at the capillary bed around the injury site, is there any real rationale in the acute phases to apply high levels of compression? And I would argue probably not. This was one of the rationales for the development of um, kinesio tape, which if you think about it, is kind of an anti-compressive device. Um, the premise is that when it's put on the skin with a stretch, it crimps the, the, the skin and the superficial tissue um, to try and uh, prevent collapse and to try and, and uh, allow um, a little bit more uh, lymphatic flow and a little bit more venous return in there. And that's a fantastic premise. And it looked very promising because when people were taking kinesio tape off, they had these wonderful, um, exciting, and uh, uh, you know, really varied patterns of bleeding, as you can see just about uh, on the bottom right. Um, but unfortunately, the evidence base wasn't stacking up with this. And unfortunately, I've got crop circles up there because um, kinesio tape's a bit like crop circles. It's, they look fantastic. It's a very mysterious pattern that, that it causes. But when it all comes down to it, they probably don't, don't, don't mean that much. And kinesio tape probably doesn't mean that much for um, acute injury management. Um, modes of compression um, that are available, for example, in accident emergency departments in the UK um, are things like tubi grip. And, and the, the, the UK um, NHS wastes thousands upon thousands of, of pounds on this. Um, and this is a really important point. If you're putting compression on, particularly around the ankle, it needs to conform to the joint and it needs to be graduated. And again, logically, a tubi grip is a tubular bandage and you're putting that on something that is L-shaped. And if you've ever had a tubi grip on your ankle, one of the first things it does is it pulls you down into dorsiflexion or plantar flexion. And plantar flexion is not a particularly good position uh, to walk in and it's not the best way to activate um, your, uh, your, your, your venous muscle pump. Um, if you're planting on your foot. And there's a lot of evidence, recent evidence, uh, to, to show. Um, so I think in terms of ankles, um, and hopefully this is, is uh, in, people will be in agreement with this, um, it's most important to conform around the area in something like a horseshoe wrap that is nice and snug and um, uh, well fitted uh, is probably the best way. And I don't think that the premise is to try and drive fluid back into the vascular system. I think that it works more by actually um, relocating uh, the edematous fluid away from the torn ligament dens. Because torn ligament dens, um, particularly around the ankle, are very sensitive. They're very pain sensitive. They're very sensitive to pressure and chemical irritation. So if you can squeeze that away, um, then you provide a much better window for rehabilitation. Should you still elevate? Um, elevation works and fits beautifully with physical principles. Um, Gravity exerts a force on um, a column of fluid, and the larger the fluid, the larger that force is. And that force is manifested in hydrostatic um, pressure. And hydrostatic pressure forces fluid out of the joint. So by elevating, you take away gravity, you decrease the hydrostatic pressure. So what elevation does um, is creates a very nice window to uh, perform some nice pain-free, potentially range of movement exercises. Does it work long term? Probably not, because um, if anyone has had um, an ankle injury or post-surgery, they put their ankle up, it feels great, you put it down and you get a rebound phenomenon uh, pretty much straight away. Um, so it does have a use, it does have um, a role, um, but uh, probably not a, a, in isolation. 
Now, I haven't talked too much about electrophysical agents, um, and uh, there's a reason for that. Um, we looked at uh, the evidence base for this in, in 2008, and, and it wasn't particularly good uh, in terms of laser and ultrasound and, and other forms of energy therapy. And um, there hasn't been a lot of uh, high quality studies since that time. Um, but taking, looking aside from um, empirical evidence, um, if you think about what you're trying to do ultimately after a lateral ligament sprain, um, is to return it as far as possible to its, its uh, pre-injury state. Entropy um, is a measure of the amount of disorder in a system. Okay, so these two pictures have got a low level of entropy. Okay, these have got a high level of entropy. High levels of disorder. And the laws of physics dictate that if we want to move something from a high level of entropy to a low level of entropy, we need to give energy into the system. It doesn't happen on its own. So energy can come in the form of lots of different things. We could shine a blue light on that, or shine a red light, or put some ultrasound on it. It's energy, and some of it might be absorbed, but it's not the type of energy that ligaments are used to responding to. Ligaments are used to responding to, they're mechanosensitive, so they're used to responding to mechanical energy. And that is the most powerful tool and powerful weapon uh, that we have. And again, um, I think that's summarized really nicely in um, um, Khan and Scott's review within BGSM. And I think that basic principle, um, coupled with um, that study, really motivated um, myself and some of my co-researchers to really look at what we're telling patients and to look at the mindset that people have when they're approaching soft tissue injuries. And I guess that we were worried that um, advising things like protection and rest um, is fine, but does it create a mindset of, of, uh, of unloading? And that can sometimes be quite difficult to break. Um, and that really motivated us to, to, to look at the acronym of police by adding in this, this phrase of optimal loading um, to try and maybe uh, change that and get people thinking a little bit more. Um, so we have elaborated uh, on this and there's a, an editorial coming out I think in, in next month's BGSM um, where we're looking at um, the, uh, you know, what optimal loading is and, and, and what it isn't. And I'm going to try and just put that into context in terms of an ankle sprain. It's not meant to be a cookie cutter type approach but more a series of principles that will hopefully um, get you thinking and get you challenged a little bit more um, as a clinician. Um, so in terms of post ankle sprain, um, walking is a form of loading, but walking um, needs to be done well, and it needs to be done well before you start to run. And that sounds like a very obvious statement, um, but people fail to get full dorsiflexion back. Um, and there is a significant amount of evidence when we look at the chronic ankle instability model, um, the two or three years down the line, the people that are suffering from this um, have got a fundamental change in their arthrokinematics. Um, so a knee to wall test is a really nice uh, thing to, to, to look at, um, coupled with some nice manual techniques um, to, to try and get that back. Um, so loading is important, um, heel striking is important in terms of driving a vascular pump um, and uh, increasing venous return. The other thing to consider when we're, when we're loading uh, tissue in the acute phases is that often it's inhibited. And the idea of a reflex inhibition, sometimes called arthrogenic muscle inhibition or arthrogenic muscle response, um, it kind of makes sense. Um, and if you look at a muscle like um, tibialis posterior, which plantar flex and inverts your ankle, um, that recreates a position of injury. And it doesn't take your brain too long to work out that when you activate that muscle, it causes pain. And that can create quite a lot of inhibition in there. So that's very important to get back. And I think in terms of um, the early exercise that we do, it's probably better to focus in on activation rather than, than pure strengthening. And that's two slightly different things. The other really important action of, um, of, of TIB post, as well as giving a nice co-contraction um, and, and functional stability to the ankle is, but if you look at its orientation, and apologize, it's just off the screen there, um, is that um, it has a, a, um, a lateral to medial orientation, and when it activates, it will give the fibula a little bit of a medial draw, and that's really important when you're in plantar flexion and your talus doesn't quite fit the interstitial space. So if that's switched off, you kind of lose that nice tweezer effect uh, that that can give you. So early stage activation of something like that is very important. Okay, in terms of um, uh, activating uh, our sensory motor system, um, 
the focus is not on feedback here, the focus is on feed forward. Um, Daniel Fong's done a lot of work and some nice case studies on this, and, and this is an extract from one of the studies. Um, but if you look at the blue arrow, that's probably where our parent eels will respond and react. 0.05 seconds. And look at the shape of the ankle. Um, we're probably uh, you know, injured already at about that time, so we've probably gone beyond the point of no return. It's not to say that perineal activation isn't important, but the focus is probably more on um, the feed forward component of our sensory motor system rather than the feedback. Um, and I'm not sure that we always do this particularly well, and I think the earlier we can start it, the better. Um, it's activation, it's not strengthening, and instead of giving people lots and lots of perineus brevis um, uh, activity and, and rep and rep after rep after rep and sitting, um, then maybe a better cue is to look at some modified calf raises and try and find a way to activate perineus longus. And um, again, using some cues such as keeping your, um, the ball of your foot planted, because obviously one of the key roles of perineus longus is keeping your first ray uh, on the ground there. If you want to optimally load a ligament, then you've got to think about um, what the ligament's function is, and particularly um, its morphology. Lateral ligaments are very different than other ligaments in the body um, in terms of their structure and function. In fact, um, if you look at some of this evidence, they're very different than the ligaments in the, the medial side and very different than the ligaments uh, in the um, subtalar joint. Um, actually, the lateral ligaments are they're really quite simple. They're dense, tightly packed bundles of collagen, which tells us that their role is primarily um, due to, uh, or primarily focused on um, controlling uh, tensile force. So we've got to try and recreate that in some way if we want to activate and stimulate. Um, possibly a common mistake is to get people standing flat, get people standing on a, on a wobble board, which is fine if you want to improve postural control. But again, are we thinking about the uh, anatomy there, um, and are we matching up uh, the position of our loading with our anatomy? Um, so some of the uh, ways in which ATFL will be loaded will be more in plantar flexion, it becomes much more of a lateral stabilizer, um, and also in foot internal uh, rotation. Um, whenever we're planted down cricket with no shoes off, I'm not convinced how much specific tensile loading that we're actually going to get uh, on um, lateral sprain. Optimal loading um, should involve reps uh, and again I put in here um, taking a Bayesian approach to, to, to rehab um, but it's basically looking at or accepting that in the early stages post injury and um, what we think a movement will feel like will be completely different uh, to what it will actually feel like and this is the basic premise of, of, of Bayesian thinking um, and that you've got a prior what you think something will, will be like you then add data to it which is the, the, the movement itself, and then you change uh, your opinion on that. So the bigger the differential between what you think a movement will feel like in the early stages and what it actually feels like um, will cause a lot of rigidity. Um, as those two things get closer together, then movement starts to become smoother, coordinated, uh, and we can move forward. But in order to do that, you need to be prepared to fail. Failure is good um, at, uh, uh, during rehab tasks. Rigidity is not, and I think, again, um, one of the uh, key things that we need to consider, even in the early stages, um, is that the foot and ankle has got a dual role. Um, it can't just be rigid all the time. Um, yes, it does act like a rigid lever, but it also needs to be flexible and conforming uh, for, uh, for full function. I think if we challenge people too early um, and they start to develop these rigid movement patterns, then we lose that ability uh, to be flexible uh, and to conform to different challenges. Um, in terms of proprioception in the early stages, um, perhaps we focus too much on postural control uh, and I think the early stages when we're maybe a little bit um, less functionally capable is a good time to actually focus in on, on proprioception per se. Um, proprioception really involves joint positional sense and kinesthesia. So joint positional sense, the ability to match joint angles. Um, and kinesthesia, the ability to sense force, not only the direction of force, but also um, the, uh, the, the magnitude of force. Um, and I think a common mistake that people make um, is whenever they're maybe doing some manual work or they're getting people to, to, to manually um, use a manual muscle testing or, 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 or therapy, is that they focus primarily on maximal voluntary contraction. 
and that's not really um, applicable. Um, you need to work through the gears, if you like. Um, and again, looking at joint positional sense, working in a non-weight bearing, and also in a weight bearing position is extremely important. <clears throat> this is a key question. Um, how much loading is enough? Um, and uh, this is probably a bit of a cop-out, um, but uh, I said I didn't want to make this a cookie-cutter approach. Um, how much loading is, is enough? I think you've got to take into consideration um, you need to load the tissue enough to get a mechanical and a neural stimulus, but avoiding um, pain and avoiding aberrant movement patterns. Bear in mind that ligaments are viscoelastic. Um, and so viscoelasticity means that the, the stress and strain curve is not linear. It also means that the mechanical properties, the biomechanics, um, will change according to time and it will change with, um, with uh, cyclical repetition. Um, and that gets um, uh, increased post-injury. So perhaps the reps need to be um, shorter, the rest time needs to be higher. Optimal loading should be pain-free. Um, and again, if you look at um, some research evidence that breaks down um, you know, histologically um, what nerve endings do lateral ligaments contain, um, well, they contain four, broadly four different categories of, of afferent nerves, but the majority of them are free nerve endings, which means that it's got a, a preponderance to relay pain. Um, so it's very difficult to challenge the other afferents uh, in a meaningful way um, if all we're feeling is pain in the area. It's difficult to multitask in that sense. Optimal loading should be variable. Um, and again, uh, there's some great work with a uh, nice editorial um, that Phil and uh, Phil Glasgow and Nikki Phillips uh, and myself have written um, in BGSM looking at what variation means in rehab in terms of um, developing a, uh, a robust athlete or a robust joint um, that is um, less likely to get injured. But varying the types of load that you're giving um, is particularly important in the early stages for the, the, um, the, the reasons I've mentioned, um, because it can um, prevent accommodation. It also creates a little bit of stress shielding so that we're not loading in the same way in the same part of the ligament over and over again. So in summary, I'm going to stop talking very soon. Um, Avoid polarized opinions, particularly when it comes to the uh, acute soft tissue arena. Um, I think you've got to still consider ice compression and elevation uh, as viable treatment options, um, but you've got to match it to the, the case in hand. Um, other forms of electrophysical agents don't really match up with the basic laws um, of, uh, of physics, I think. And you've got to bear in mind that above everything else, that ligaments are mechanosensitive uh, structures. Um, Optimal loading is mechanical, um, it's variable, it considers the anatomy morphology, and ultimately it has to be pain-free, particularly in the early stages. And a final thought, the other thing that people think about um, when you talk about handball um, in Ireland, um, it's not that we're so poor that we can't afford squash rackets, um, this is actually traditional Gaelic handball. Um, so, uh, there it is. Thank you very much.